Isaiah was a court prophet. Isaiah was a prophet in Jerusalem. He was a prophet in the midst of the purple. He, he, he walked in the midst of the kings and the king's court and the nobility in the city of Jerusalem. Vastly different from Amos. Amos was a farmer. But Isaiah was familiar with the intrigues of the palace and of international events. Isaiah spoke to what was happening not only in the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Judah, but in the nations of the earth. It's helpful to know that Isaiah was a prophet in Jerusalem for the reign of five different kings. When my brother and I studied at Hebrew University, we lived on a hill just um, a stone's throw from the old city of Jerusalem. We were in an apartment building, and at nighttime, I'd, I'd some would often walk up on the roof, and you could sit there, and the Temple Mount was below us, and it was lit up at night. You could see it, and times we'd be homesick or lonely. We just wanted sweet tea and sausage gravy. There's some comfort in that. But I remember sitting on that roof, looking over at the Temple Mount, thinking that King David prayed there, and Solomon offered sacrifices there, and Isaiah prayed there. And we're still calling on the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was meaningful to me in those days in Jerusalem, but it's meaningful to me in these days in Tennessee again. But Isaiah was a prophet in Jerusalem in the midst of all the palace intrigue for five different kings, very different kings. When we read of Isaiah's commissioning in the sixth chapter, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, that was the first of the kings. Uzziah was a good king. He began and, and served the majority of his reign as a godly king. He's recognized that way in Scripture, but he ended poorly. The second king was Jotham. He reigned for 19 years, and the Bible records that he was a godly king. And he was followed by Ahaz, a 20-year reign. It says he was a wicked king, defeated by multiple enemies. God refused to give him victory because of the, the wickedness that he perpetrated in the land of Israel. And the fourth was Hezekiah. He reigned 29 years. The Bible says he was a godly king, a king that honored the Lord and encouraged the people to do the same. It was during the reign of Hezekiah that the Assyrians besieged the city of Jerusalem with an army of 185,000 troops. And the commander of their army stood outside the walls of Jerusalem and taunted the people in the language that they understood. And God sent Isaiah with a message to the king. He said, don't trouble yourself about these people. I'll send them home the way they came. And the angel of the Lord devastated that army. There was a time in biblical scholarship where scholars suggested that that was a mythical story. It wasn't too long ago when the archaeologists began to excavate outside one of the walls that Hezekiah built, they began to find the armor and the skeletons of, Ass of Assyrians. <laughs> Mythical skeletons. And then finally, Isaiah was a prophet under King Manasseh. Manasseh reigned 53 years. He was a wicked, wicked king, one of the worst kings of Judah. He engaged in devil worship. He even sacrificed his own son to the demonic god Molech in the fires in the Hinnom Valley beside Jerusalem. He had an extraordinarily long reign. He hated Isaiah. He forbade Isaiah to speak. Ultimately, he was so tormented by Isaiah's presence that he determined to kill him. And according to Jewish history, Manasseh ordered that a hollow tree trunk be brought to the city that Isaiah would be bound hand and foot, stuffed into the tree trunk, and sawn in two. It's referenced in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of fame of faith. Near the end of that chapter, it says that the world wasn't worthy of those that, that came in the name of God, that some of them were sawn in two. It's worth noting that Isaiah served the Lord and the Lord's people with both godly and wicked kings. He didn't retire based upon the political party in power or even the attitude of those in power towards God. Now, oftentimes those that he's, under whom he served had enormous influences on his life, but he had an assignment that transcended what was happening. He wasn't separate from the political ideas of his day. He spoke into them. 
And you and I can't withdraw from the arena based on whether we like or we don't like whoever happens to be leading in the season. We stand with a higher assignment, with a greater mission, with a higher calling, with a perspective on truth that can protect our children and our grandchildren far more than the rulings of temporary leaders in our nation. Isaiah is an important book. You've taken the time to read it. I'll give you just a a couple of ideas that might help if you want to go back and do some review. There are 66 chapters. You you understand when it was written, there were no chapter heading. There were no chapters were not numbered nor verses. Those came much later. We put them in to help us reference and find the places that we were talking about. So Isaiah didn't write in his chapter headings. 66 chapters, in case you don't remember, there's 66 books in the Bible. And Isaiah is broken into two sections The first is 39 chapters. It deals more with the challenges facing Israel and God's response is judgment upon them. That cycle of retribution that we're introduced to in the book of Judges that is repeated so frequently in our Bible is played out in that first section of the book of Isaiah. 39 books in the Old Testament. That leaves 27 chapters for the second section of Isaiah, and there just happens to be 27 books in the New Testament. And in that second section of Isaiah, he talks a great deal about the Messiah. In fact, he gives us more information about the Messiah and his reign in the earth when he returns to the earth than any of the other prophets. If you've just finished reading it, you may have noticed it's not arranged chronologically. You're welcome. Can add to the confusion sometimes. But it's a collection of different prophecies made by Isaiah over a 40-year period of time. Multiple kings, multiple historical settings, different challenges, different empires rising and, and others falling. He oversees the transition between the Assyrians being the dominant world power and they're, they're being conquered by the Babylonians as they rise. In fact, the Hezekiah story provides the transition between the Assyrian empire and the Babylonians. So Isaiah has an assignment that goes far beyond the rise and fall of empires or the rise and fall of kings or even his personal comfort. It happens to be one of the most affirmed books in all of the Hebrew Bible. It wasn't too long ago that it was one of the most attacked in biblical scholarship. Both Jewish and Christian scholars said that no one person could have been responsible for the, the poetry and the majesty and the perspective in the book of Isaiah. And they began to break it into pieces and say that Christians had written part of it and inserted in there long after it had been a part of the, the Hebrew Bible. And the Jewish scholars weighed in and said not only was it corrupted by Christians, it was corrupted by other things. God tolerated that for a while. In 1948, in a cave on the shores of the Dead Sea, a a Bedouin shepherd boy, at least that's the story that's most popular. But the truth of it is they found a scroll, an ancient scroll, and when the scholars examined it, it was an entire text of the book of Isaiah. Now here's the fun part. The text went back to about 100 B.C., So the Christians couldn't have corrupted it. There were no Christians 100 B.C. In fact, that scroll of Isaiah they found by the Dead Sea was a thousand years older than the best copy of the book of Isaiah that biblical scholars had, Jewish or Christian. And it was almost identical to the one that was a thousand years older. God just slipped a copy of Isaiah in a cave by the Dead Sea and kept it until he could take the work of about a hundred years of biblical scholars and go, that's a Greek word that means I disagree. God can defend his integrity. You don't have to spend your emotions doing that. Now, I want to take the time we have left and ask you to just take a little walk with me. I'd like to to take some lessons from Isaiah, some lessons from Scripture, and see if we can understand their implications for us. I don't like to read my Bible just to study it as history or as a theological treatise. I want to understand its implications for my life. What does it mean to me and the choices I have to make and the the problems that present and the, the, the forks in the road that we come to? We need God's wisdom. And God has given us His Word and the help of his spirit to understand it. So I'm just going to make a handful of observations. The first that we can learn from Isaiah and from the prophets and from the broader story of Scripture is that God is involved in history. 
He not only created the earth and everything that's in it, he's involved in the unfolding story of humanity. The Bible says he raises up leaders and he puts them down. That he watches over the affairs of nations. Through Isaiah, he said, I'll take the Assyrians and I'll send them home. You don't need to worry about them. Don't lose any sleep. They may outnumber your armies. They may be more sophisticated in their military schemes and technology, but they will not threaten this city. And they were gone within 48 hours. God is involved in the unfolding story of human history. Isaiah 14 in verse 1 says, The Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. Aliens will join them and unite with the house of Jacob. Nations will take them and bring them to their own place. And the house of Israel will possess the nations as men servants and maid servants in the Lord's land. And they will make captives of their captors and they'll rule over their oppressors. Tiny Israel, it's a tiny little sliver of land on the end of the Mediterranean. It was a, a waste heap for centuries, really unwanted by anyone until God began to reestablish the Jewish people in that land. The modern state of Israel was born in 1948 and the Jewish people have come from more than 100 nations. Until now, they're the dominant power in that region. There is no peace in the Middle East unless Israel is involved. We've been watching historic peace accords be worked out in recent months. Things that have not happened since the modern nation of Israel was born. There are miracles of biblical proportion and biblical significance. And you're watching it with your own eyes. That You don't need the media's affirmation. You've got the affirmation from the Word of God to know it's significant. God is moving in the earth. He's involved in human history. And the second lesson I would submit to you is that our choices, yours and mine, Individually, as families, collectively, as congregations, as communities, as nations, our choices either invite God's blessing or his discipline. God cares about the choices of your life. He's given you a free will. You can make choices as you choose. But God gives us clarity on the outcomes. We don't have the strength to determine the outcomes. There are too many things in play, too many people, too many forces beyond our ability and our strength. Our knowledge is limited. Our experience is small. So God in his wisdom shows us the path and encourages us to walk his pathway, saying that the outcomes in God's choices are better for our lives. So don't ever lose sight of the fact that the battle inside of you to choose godliness or ungodliness is a path towards an outcome, not just a momentary feeling. It's not just about your emotions or your intellect or what you would like. There are, there are more powerful things in play. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. And though they're red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. For the Lord, the, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's pretty plain. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the best of the land. But if you're not, if you resist and you rebel, you'll be devoured. Our choices either invite the blessings of God or the judgment of God. Say, well, I don't like that. Duly noted. Now let me remind you that your choices will either bring the blessings of God or the judgment of God. Your liking it doesn't change the reality. I don't like the fact that ice cream doesn't build muscle. Seems to me that a mega dose of chocolate should solve most health problems. But the fact that I think it or I would like it doesn't make it the reality. Isaiah 63, verse 1. It's a sobering passage. It says, Who is this coming from Edom, from Basra, with his garments stained crimson? Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. It's a picture of Messiah. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? 
I have trodden the winepress alone. From the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. It's a portrait of God's judgment of the Messiah bringing judgment to the earth. Well, some people will say, you know, that's the Old Testament and God's a bit harsh in the Old Testament. Don't like to read the Old Testament because God's a little cranky. Well, to all of those people, I'd like to read a New Testament passage. It's Revelation 19. It too is describing the Messiah. And the language is very, very similar to what we just read in Isaiah 63. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. Who's the rider on that white horse? It's Jesus. It says, with justice, he judges and makes war. I thought Jesus was all about love. Well, love is certainly an aspect of his character. But God in his love disciplines us. It takes love to bring justice. See, parents who never discipline their children don't love them. And there will be no justice in our nation. There will be no justice in our nation until we submit to God's royal decrees. It won't come by political decree. With justice, he judges and makes war. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, Then out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He'll rule them with an iron scepter. And he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Again, the point is that our choice is yours and mine, not someone else's. Forget the people that you don't like. Forget the people that you think are on the wrong side of the discussion. Forget the people you think have made immoral choices. This is about you and me. Our choices have consequences to either invite the blessings of God or his discipline. The third point is that God has an opinion regarding human behavior. Here's a suggestion. If you believe in a creator, if you believe almighty God created heaven and earth, If you believe the Bible is his inspired word, if you believe his spirit will indwell a human being, the suggestion would be perhaps we want to find out what his opinion is regarding our behavior. I confess, if I I purchase something and it has instructions, I don't usually read them until I can't put it together on my own. After I've done my best from what I think it should look like, after all, there was a picture on the box and a picture in my mind. That should be enough. Don't need no stinking instructions. Until I got done and I got a half a dozen parts and it won't work. And then I open the instructions and they're written in four languages and that's always annoying because I'm still working on English. But God has given us instructions. You see, sin, righteousness, those are determined by God. Not by Congress or the Supreme Court. You need God's perspective. It isn't whether we agree or we disagree. We need to understand God's perspective and then determine to bring ourselves into alignment. Psalm 33 in verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Folks, God has an opinion. This, is a, this, this principle is introduced to us in the opening pages of our Bible. I've told you on many occasions that those early chapters of Genesis introduce us to the big rock ideas of the Bible. And after we meet Adam and Eve and and their drama in the garden, they didn't get to stay in the garden just because they had had a deed. They forfeited their privilege. 
The authority that had been invested to them was taken away, and they were not only driven out of the garden, they were banished from ever returning to it. And then we meet Cain and Abel, their sons. It's Genesis 4. It says, she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel, but on Cain and his offering, he didn't look with favor. So Cain was angry, and his face was downcast. God had given him instructions on how to present offerings. Abel cooperated, and Cain brought what he chose. And it says God looked at Abel with favor and with, with, on Cain with dissatisfaction, and it made Cain angry. Rebellion, pride, stubbornness. He had options. God has an opinion about your behavior and mine. Cooperate. It's not easy. There's a battle within us. It's why I object to people that say they don't have a choice, that their behavior is, is beyond them. It's determined by something that they don't have an influence over. The redemptive work of the cross, what Jesus did for us through his sacrificial death on the cross and his resurrection gives us the authority to defeat everything that would take us away from godliness. It says in Peter, we've been given everything we need for life and godliness the power of God is sufficient. If we will choose the Lord, there is a power present to deliver us from anything that would bring distraction. That is the good news of the gospel. But God has an opinion. We don't, he doesn't want us to miss this. Two chapters later in the unfolding story of Genesis, it's Genesis 6, we meet this character by the name of Noah. He liked boats. Although I'm thinking by the end of his life, he didn't like boats so much. But in Genesis 6 and verse 5, it said, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord was grieved that he'd made man, and his heart was filled with pain. Do you, do you under, the imagination that God's heart is filled with pain by the choices we make? I want Jesus to smile when he thinks about me. I don't want to make him grind his teeth. It, it help, it'll help you in the struggle in your life. Because the godly choices are not easy. They're not easy for pastors. They're not easy if you're old. They're not easy if you're young. They're not easy if you're single or you're married. There's, there's no station in life where it just gets easier to be godly. There's a tug of war in that. And then we have an adversary who tempts you and prompts you and tries his best to deceive you to choose ungodliness. I, I know it's universal. He even tried it on Jesus. And if he had the audacity and the arrogance to, to tempt Jesus and to try to deceive him into making a wrong choice, I promise you, he'll try it with you and me. God sent a flood. You know the story. The Lord said, I'll wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. There were only eight people saved. Folks, there's a lesson there in flashing neon lights. God has an opinion. Maybe we should try to understand it and bring alignment. You will not convince him to agree with you in your ungodliness. Forget everybody else. If we will choose the Lord, God will do whatever he needs to care for his people. He'll gather the Jewish people from a hundred nations and establish them on a little sliver of ground in the midst of tens of millions of people dedicated to their destruction and cause them to flourish to the consternation of the United Nations. And he will watch over his church. But we have to care about him. There's the fourth lesson, I think, from Isaiah and in this season, and that's that God's judgments may even be generational. They may reach beyond your lifetime. In fact, you may be living in, with the judgment of a generation that preceded you, or you may make choices that bring God's judgment upon generations who follow you. In fact, I would submit to you that the best gift you can give to your children or your grandchildren is to honor the Lord with your life. 
It'll bring blessings that far outweigh the resources you accumulate or, or the opportunities that you present to them or the training that you give to them. In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 9, it says, The Lord Almighty declared in my hearing. There, there's a, I don't have much time, but there's an image of that. It says, Isaiah said, I heard the Lord say something. And you can almost hear the wonder, the, 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 the anxiety it brings. The Lord Almighty declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate and the fine mansions left without occupants. A 10-acre vineyard will produce only a small amount of wine and a, a homer of seed, only a bit of grain. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks or who stay up late at night until they are inflamed with wine. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, tambourines and flutes and wine, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of His hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile. Their men of rank will die of hunger, and their masses will be parched with thirst. It's a harsh statement. When God says you're going into exile, He doesn't mean you're going to be quarantined at home for two weeks. There's a foreign invader coming and your city will be destroyed and you'll be taken as slaves, those of you who survive. And you're going to live for decades in a foreign land. Your children are going to learn new languages and new recipes. They're going to be exposed to gods you've never imagined. Folks, our choices matter. And again, somebody say, Pastor, that's the Old Testament. God's a little cranky. Before he wrote Matthew, he had a Prozac. Well, in Luke chapter 19, Jesus himself is talking. And he's prophesying over the city of Jerusalem. And he said, the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And they'll dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. That's Jesus. They're going to dash your children against the stones of the city. Folks, our choices have an impact far beyond ourselves. I'm about done. A couple more quick lessons. God's preparing a people for himself. Don't lose sight of that. When you see him gathering the Jewish people to that little land of Israel and establishing them there, you need to know that at the same time he's doing something else, something parallel in the earth. He's establishing a church, people from every nation, race, language, and tribe. He's purifying a church, a bride without spot or wrinkle. In the closing chapters of the saga of the church, we're going to need the help of the Jewish people to close that out. I think we're very near the, the time of the Gentiles that's talked about in the Gospels that Jesus talked about. We will cons consistently see the Jewish people speaking truth to us to help us understand our Bibles. I had a, a meeting this week with a, a Jewish man. He's a pastor and a businessman in Israel in the city of Jerusalem. I walked away from the meeting with a, a, amazed at the insight and understanding he had about the Word of God and what he could share with me over breakfast. It's an exciting time to be a part of what God's doing. He's preparing a people for himself. Jeremiah 31, this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel. Declares the Lord, I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I'll be their God and they'll be my people. Isaiah 62, 6, I've posted watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They'll never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. Give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. I want to commend you. We did a three-day prayer watch. Thousands of you participated. Around the clock, 24 hours a day for three days. You came hour after hour faithfully praying. Many more joined us online across the country. God is responding. Don't, don't yield that. Don't turn loose of it with your faith. It's not about the outcomes we always see or understand. God is moving in the earth. He's preparing a people. We're going to see the greatest harvest of souls into the kingdom of God that our world has ever known. We're going to need more screens. It'll be okay. And finally, I would remind you that the Messiah will reign over all the earth. 
Hallelujah. Don't get too heated up about leaders that we choose. Balances of power. The Messiah will reign over all the earth. The whole world will know his glory. There's a new world order coming. It's important to know. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4, he'll judge between the nations and he'll settle disputes for many peoples. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. A nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. You know, a portion of that verse is carved in a granite block outside the United Nations building in New York. But they didn't take the whole verse. They liked the part where it said they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. But you need the sentence that precedes it. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. There's a king coming who will be the judge of all the earth. And because he will reign in righteousness and truth and holiness and purity, we won't make war any longer. Hallelujah. There's a purpose to our faith that extends far beyond the preference of your worship style or whether we sit inside or outside or we put our left foot in or our left foot out. And we've been a little sedated. We got lulled into a place of ambivalence, of, of just not that heightened of an interest. And we looked at church as kind of an inconvenient, necessary nuisance. But folks, there's a value in being included in the people of God. There's a strength that comes from being together. If you don't need that strength, someone needs yours. There'll come a time you'll need their strength. And it's too late to build a relationship when you need the strength. We're learning as we've never known in my lifetime the value of the church and the earth. To understand that they may try to shutter the doors and tell you to stay away. God will give us away. The king is coming. Philippians 2, some of you still prefer the New Testament. It says, God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him a name that's above every name. That the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. You want to make it your life ambition to be a friend of the king. He's made it possible for you to be a part of his kingdom. No matter how dark your past, how gross the failures, how deep the depravity that you may have been embroiled in, through the blood of Jesus, you can be delivered out of the hand of the enemy. You can may be clean and whole. You can even be delivered from the spirit of self-righteousness and arrogance that is so prominent in the midst of those of us who gather in churches. God is a deliverer. And he's preparing a people. And I want to be a part. And I know you do too. That's why you sit outside in the middle of winter and watch God turn up the thermostat. <laughs> Might make me a believer in climate change yet. I don't know. I want to close by asking you to join me in a proclamation. And it's, I built it from Isaiah 61. I only changed a couple of words. You can check me. When Jesus went into the synagogue in the town where he grew up in, in um, Nazareth, they brought in the scripture reading for that day. It's, a, it's, it's common then and today to do a scripture reading in the synagogues on the Sabbath. And the portion that day was Isaiah 61. It's recorded in Luke chapter 4. And Jesus took the scripture portion. He read from Isaiah and he closed the scroll and he handed it back to the attendant and he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He said, the day God is bringing that passage into completion before your very eyes. And sometimes I, I read my Bible and I think how amazing it would have been to be in the multitude that left Egypt with Moses. What would it have been like to have crossed through the Red Sea or to have picked up manna on the ground? What would it have been like to have blown your trumpet outside the walls of Jericho and watched him begin to shake? Or what would it have been like when David brought the ark into Jerusalem or to see Solomon complete the temple or to have stood in the crowd and heard Jesus teach and watched him do his miracles? Well, we weren't called to those times and places, but we've been called to this season. 
And I assure you that the purposes of God are moving in the earth. They're watching over his word to fulfill it just as certainly today as they were in that synagogue in Nazareth about two millennia ago. Don't imagine your role is small. Don't imagine your voice is insignificant. Don't imagine that the battle that rages in your heart and your mind and your emotions is your imagination. It's not. But God has called us. And he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. Don't you turn loose. Don't you quit. Don't turn loose of your prayers. Don't turn loose of your faith. Don't turn loose of your hope. Our God is able. Amen. Amen. I brought you a proclamation. If you'll stand with me. Have you got your outdoor voice? Okay. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. We will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Did you know that God chose you to be a canvas that he could display his splendor upon for all the world to see? That God looked at you and me and all of our inconsistencies and weaknesses and said, I can make you an oak of righteousness. <laughs> I'm happier than you are about this. Amen. I think we ought to close by just taking a moment to give thanks to the Lord. He's blessed us. He's given us a beautiful sanctuary in which to meet. He's given our children classrooms where they can gather and be safe. He's restoring his church in our nation. And we'll take our places in his end time purposes. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you tonight. We give you glory and praise and honor and thanksgiving. We lift our hands and our hearts and our voices to you. Lord, let the heaviness go. Let the despair go. Let there come a new anticipation, a new sense of excitement an awareness the Spirit of God is moving in the earth, that you're calling your church forth, that you're preparing us. We praise you for it, that we're not alone. We're not left with our strength, with our resources, with just our ideas. And, but we are called by Almighty God that your Spirit indwells us, that we are who you say we are. We can do what you say we can do, that our strength is not our limit. Our intellect is not our limit. We praise you for it tonight, that we will see the deliverance of our God. We worship you. You're our health and our strength. You're our provider. We praise you for it. Let the joy of the Lord fill our hearts. Let the joy of the Lord fill our hearts in Jesus' name. We praise you for it tonight. We worship you. You are worthy. We thank you that you reign over the nations of the earth. We praise you for it. We praise you for it, that you've called us out of darkness into the kingdom of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thanks so much for giving me just a moment of your time. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, I want to encourage you to do a couple of things. Give it a like, share it with your friends. Most importantly, subscribe. That way, when there's new content or a live stream, you'll be notified. I pray God blesses you in your spiritual journey. I'll see you soon.